Hello and welcome class, where here we are at the beginning of the end. So normally in uh, how I break down my <laughs> general chemistry lecture series in the fall uh, is that we start with chapter one of Virgin Overby and attempt to make it through chapter 10. Now, uh, sometimes we make it all the way through chapter 10, sometimes we just get somewhere in chapter 10, but you can see here, we're in chapter nine, just starting chapter nine. This signifies that we are truly approaching <laughs> the beginning of the end. So chapter nine is all about aqueous solutions and understanding what an aqueous solution is, how it can uh, help mediate um, a certain number of chemical reactions. Water is an excellent reaction medium, uh, as well as um, it is an incredibly interesting molecule in and of its own right, uh, primarily for the following reasons. So water is essential for life as far as we know it. And this uh, observation has led us to create a whole field of study uh, known as astrobiology. So in astrobiology, we look for signs of life off of the planet's surface. Uh, one really awesome breakthrough that happened not too long ago in the field of astrobiology uh, was announced in 2016 and it had to do with the moon Europa. It had been found that water plumes, these huge geysers, were gushing water um, off of the surface into interstellar space, like far off of the surface of the planet, much larger uh, than geysers we see here on Earth. And so what this signified was that there must be, underneath this iced, frozen surface of a moon, some type of liquid subsurface ocean. And the liquid that comprised these oceans was water. Now, water is necessary for life, again, as we know it. It is an excellent reaction medium. Amino acids, proteins, uh, DNA can be suspended in water. Cells are mostly made of water, uh, that type of plasma that helps to hold in like the mitochondria, the nucleus, all that good stuff. And so wherever there is a sign of water, there is potentially a sign of life. Jeff Yoder, one of the scientists working on this project, this Europa project, uh, you know, was recorded saying, uh, that Europa's oceans are considered to be uh, one of the most promising places that could potentially harbor life in the solar system, specifically that is not on this planet Earth. Now, we don't know for sure whether or not uh, there is any type of life underneath the subsurface oceans of Europa yet. Uh, suffice to say that more than likely it's going to end up being bacterial life, but like who knows where it could be. Where there is a sign of water, there is a sign that there is more than likely uh, a series of complex chemical reactions occurring. The types of chemical reactions that can potentially lead to life as we understand it here on Earth. So in order to get a good idea for like what it is that these astrobiologists are studying, like why it is that they're looking for water, we need to, at the chemistry level, general chemistry level, do our best to understand what types of reactions can water mediate? Why is it that water is such a, uh, an excellent signal to be looking for out in interstellar space? So here we are going to define what an aqueous solution is. And over the course of chapter nine, we're going to be introducing precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, as well as redox reactions. Each of these three uh, classifications or types of reactions occur predominantly in aqueous solution, and all three of these can potentially build to life-bringing reactions. So what is an aqueous solution then? Well, by definition, an aqueous solution is some type of homogeneous mixture of a solute dissolved in water. The term aqueous in terms of, you know, like Latin declension, uh, refers to the fact that we have water somewhere in this solution, right? Aqua meaning water. So our question is what's a solute, since by definition an aqueous solution is a solute dissolved in water. Well, the solute is any component of the solution that is not the solvent. So here we have another term that we have to define. What's a solvent? The solvent is the most abundant component of a solution. So in aqueous solutions, again, emphasis on the aqua in the aqueous, uh, the solvent is going to be water. The solvent is going to be our H2O. And so then by definition, an aqueous solution is going to be predominantly a collection of water, 
but the solute is going to be anything that's mixed in with the water and is evenly spread through it. For example, in the pictures to the right, we can see that there are one, two, three, four different dyed solutions. Now, to be fair, these might actually be some type of like predominant uh, chemical solution that's going to be used in a reaction. But normally in science, when we see very bright colors presented like so, it's just dye. Um, so we have like red dye, yellow dye, green dye, blue dye. To me, this looks like uh, red 40, yellow 5, green 3, and blue 1. Um, but the important thing and how this connects to our definitions of aqueous solutions is that let's say for instance, we're looking at this green flask since it is the one that is the most bright. It is going to be comprised of water and green number three, let's say hypothetically. Well, water is going to be the most abundant thing present inside of this flask. And so the water is going to be the solvent. The green number three is going to be defined therefore as our solute. Each of these green number three molecules is going to be spread out, surrounded by water. In fact, water is more than likely what each of these green three molecules is going to see because there's going to be so much water around. So each of these dye molecules will be suspended in the solvent. And since they are suspended and spread out, this means that they're going to be or more easily accessible to chemical reaction. Before we get into chemical reactions though, we have to talk about how an individual solute is going to interact with the solvent. So there are two different processes, two different ways that a solute can interact with the solute or solvent, in this case, water. The first is dissolution and the second is dissociation. So these two words are pretty similar, but they define two different ways in which things react with water in solution. Dissolution, is the process of an ionic compound dissolving into ions when uh, in the presence of an aqueous solution. Dissociation is the act of a molecular compound separating into distinct molecules when in aqueous solution. So we can see the first definition pertains to how ionic compounds interact with water, and the second pertains to how molecular compounds react with water. So we can uh, use the two molecules below in the example. We can use sodium chloride and table sugar uh, and write out some basic chemical equations for how these two things interact with water differently to get a good idea for why uh, dissolution and dissociation are defined as two separate terms. So dissolution pertains to ionic compounds. So let's write our NaCl solid up here underneath dissolution. Well, when in the presence of water, I'm gonna write this reaction arrow with water up on top of it, uh, because water is the medium with which the following reaction occurs, our sodium chloride is going to break down into ions. We're gonna break down into sodium plus in aqueous phase, as well as chloride minus in aqueous phase. Notice that sodium plus and chloride minus are not stated as being in a liquid phase. This is because we are not working with a pure substance. The sodium chloride is in the presence of water. We have a homogeneous mixture. So we cannot say that these things are in liquid state. Instead, each of these individual ions are surrounded by, I mean, dozens of water molecules individually. All right, but the act of taking a solid and breaking it into the two ionic pieces uh, pertains or is by definition a dissolution reaction. We have dissolved the sodium and the chloride. Dissociation more or less has to do with uh, associating. So like if two things are associating, they're hanging out next to each other. If they are disassociating, they are going to separate from each other. The way that we represent sugar interacting with water and how it, like we would say conventionally dissolves, is that our C6H12O6 would start in the form of a solid, right? Like a tablespoon of sugar. You sprinkle it into a cup of water, mix it around, you're going to see the solid disappear. And this is because our C6H12O6 molecules, which were previously crystallized and stuck together, are going to separate. Unlike the ionic component though, they are not going to separate into ions, but will rather separate into individual molecules. So if we start, let's say with a collection of C6H12O6 molecules 
bound together. Let's say this is like our crystalline form where each of these rectangles is a C6H12O6. After dissolving, each of these molecules is going to be separated and suspended in different locations because they will each individually be surrounded by a bunch of water molecules. So this is what it means to dissociate. We are separating each of the sugar molecules from the other sugar molecules, but we can't break them down any further than that. The reason why uh, has to do with how strong the intermolecular forces are between the water and the sugar, as, to po or as opposed to how strong the covalent bonds are between the carbons, the hydrogens, and the oxygens within sugar. So because sugar is a very strong and stable molecule, the water molecules will not be able to tear everything apart, but we will be able to separate each of these individual Lego pieces, each of these individual rectangles into their own separate molecules suspended in solution by dozens and dozens of water molecules. So this type of process, dissolution versus dissociation, is how we can describe ionic versus covalent things interacting with water. If you're working with an ionic species, it is going to, more than likely, especially if it dissolves, follow this dissolution process and turn into broken ions in solution. If you're working with a molecular compound, it will follow dissociation, and each of the individual molecules will separate from each other, but you will not see anything breaking down further than that. All right, so once your things are broken down into solution, once your solute is suspended by water molecules, how can we measure how much stuff you have? How much solute is there? Well, the most common means for measuring concentration is uh, by taking the number of moles of solute particles you have and dividing it, it by the total volume of the solution. This we call molarity. Now we've been working with molarity off and on in lab the entire semester so far. Uh, and in lab, you've already gotten some hands-on experience with what molarity means. So we're going to find the number of moles of our solute. Again, this is a counting unit, counting unit. And so once you know how much stuff there is, uh, how much sodium chloride or how much sugar, you're going to take that total count and divide it by the volume of solution. So the volume of solution is going to be the sum of the volumes of the solvent and solute. So you're looking at the total amount of stuff that's present, uh, and we're going to take this as our whole. So molarity is kind of like density, only instead of mass divided by volume, we're taking moles divided by volume, and the moles specifically are going to be our solute. All right, so let's get some practice calculating the concentration of a particular solution. Here we are going to calculate the molarity of a sodium sulfate solution, which is made by taking 55.8 grams of sodium sulfate and dissolving it into water, and in total making a 2.5 liter aqueous solution. So I would like you guys to pause the video and calculate uh, what is the concentration of this sodium sulfate solution. All right, hello and welcome back. So let's break down how to solve this type of problem together. Uh, hopefully you were able to find an answer. Let's at least compare together to see if it's the right answer. So we're gonna calculate the molarity of our sodium sulfate solution. We dissolved, I'm just gonna start gathering information, 55.8 grams, <laughs> grams of sodium sulfate, where there are two sodiums per every one sulfate. And we dissolved this in 2.50 liters of solution. So in order to calculate a molarity, we are going to need moles of solute, solute, and divide it by liters of solution. Well, we already have a volume present, uh, 2.50 liters of solution. There's no conversion that we have to do. So we're still looking for moles of solute, but we do have 2.50 liters of solution. So in order to calculate a molarity with the unit presented of molarity being a capital M, uh, we're gonna need to find the total moles of solute that we have. 
Well, fortunately, since we are told what the mass of sodium sulfate is, we can use this to find moles of sodium sulfate, since sodium sulfate, by definition, is going to be the solute. This is not water, which means since we're working with an aqueous solution, anything present that's not water has to be solute. So let's take this 55.8 grams of sodium sulfate and convert it into the unit of the mole. So we need to use our periodic table, as we have done dozens of times before, uh, to find what the molar mass of sodium sulfate is. So we're going to take our 55.8 grams and divide it by the molar mass, which uh, is found to be 142.04 grams of sodium sulfate per every one mole. And this is going to give us a total number of moles equal to 0 0.393 moles. So it may have appeared as though we started with a very large mass, but because sodium sulfate is inherently kind of a massive compound, it also has a very large molar mass, and in the end, we don't actually have that many moles of substance that we are working with. But this was not what we were asked to find. We're asked to find molarity. So we're gonna, going to take this number of moles, insert it into the numerator of our equation of this ratio we're trying to find of moles per volume. So we're going to take 0.393 moles, divide it by the 2.50 liters that is already present, and this is going to give us a total value of 0.157 molarity, 0.157 moles of sodium sulfate per every liter of solution present. But this is not the only type of molarity that we can find. Sometimes we might wanna pay attention to a particular ion, a specific ion. So in this case, or in the event that we uh, want to pay attention to a particular ion, not just the compound on the whole, we are going to need to use stoichiometry to break down, uh, like mathematically speaking, the ion of choice that we want to pay attention to. So the concentration of each individual ion might differ from the original ionic compound once it has dissolved. And this has to do with how many ions actually break off once the dissolution or dissociation has happened. So for instance, let's say we take the solution that we just worked with and we're not curious about the sodium and the sulfate. Let's say we're curious about the concentration of the sodium specifically from the previous solution. Well, we need to ask ourselves how many sodiums are there in the previous compound. In other words, once our sodium sulfate in its solid form has dissolved in the presence of water, how many sodiums and how many sulfates are going to be present after the dissociation has occurred? To answer this question, all we need to do is look at the subscripts that are present. This is going to tell us once our uh, ionic compound has broken up, how many sodiums and how many sulfates there will be. Sodium sulfate breaks down into two sodiums with a positive charge each in aqueous form and one sulfate that has a two minus charge. And so here we can conclude based off of our chemical reaction, because that's what stoichiometry really means is that we are using a chemical reaction to observe the ratios of reactants to products. For every one sodium sulfate, we will get two sodium plus ions. This means that our original concentration of the sodium sulfate which we had calculated to be in the previous problem, 0.157 molarity, is going to double when we pay attention or convert to how many sodium ions specifically we are working with. There are two sodiums per every one sodium sulfate. And so the concentration of the sodium ion after the uh, dissolution has occurred is going to be equal to 0. 314 molar. So conventionally, the labels on bottles or the ways that we report concentrations of solutions is going to be equal to the compound that we started with. However, if we like choose to take it a step further, let's say, and observe a specific cation or anion, we are going to have to use stoichiometry to calculate what the true concentration of that particular ion is going to be after the dissociation or dissolution has occurred. So we're just going to keep this in mind moving forward. If ever I say, for instance, 
what's the concentration of sodium sulfate, you're gonna go through the process that we just saw in the previous example, and you would report 0.157 molar. However, if I am asking you a specific ion after the dissolution has occurred, then you're going to have to use stoichiometry as we just saw here to uh, report what the official concentration of the broken compound is going to be. So how can these concentrations be physically manipulated? What does it truly mean to have a concentration? Well, a concentration is just stuff in water. How much stuff do you have in the water? Well, if we add more water, we are fundamentally going to change the concentration of the solute that is present because we're increasing the volume by doing so. This process of lowering the concentration by adding more solvent is known as dilution. And this is a term that you might have already just heard or known of in day-to-day -day life. If you're working with diluted coffee, it means that there's too much water in your coffee. If you're drinking like diluted Kool-Aid, it means that you have too much water and not enough Kool-Aid or diluted lemonade or anything like that. To be diluted means that you have too much water and not enough of the stuff that you're actually interested in. This definition does extend to chemistry. If we are paying attention to a particular solute, a diluted solution is going to have too much of the solvent. Now, the first observation that we can make in chemistry, and again, this is probably something you've made in day-to-day -day life or day-to-day -day life prior to taking this class. If you take a solution that is more concentrated and add water to it, add water, and every step of the way we see that whatever is suspended in solution becomes further and further apart, right? It becomes more diluted in a conventional sense. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is, be or like how we can explain this observation is water is colorless. So as you add more and more water, you are going to be adding more and more of a colorless species to solution. So you're going to end up spreading out the particles that have color or carry color with them. In this case, it looks like blue number one. Uh, you know, like in cherry Kool-Aid, it would be like red 40. In coffee, it would be like the like actual bean juice. Um, the more water you add, the more colorless your solution is going to appear. So dilute solutions always tend to have this washed out nature to them observationally because of the addition of water. But how does this affect our quantitative measurements? I mean, sure, qualitatively, we can look at this picture and say, ah, yes, to the left, we have something more concentrated. To the right, we have something less concentrated. But how would adding water specifically change the quantitative measurement of our concentration? For this, we are going to use the infamous equation M1V1 equals M2V2. This equation is useful because the moles of solute are going to be equal before and after dilution. AKA, what changes is the volume of water. We're not changing the amount of solute that's present, we're just spreading it out. So for instance, let's say uh, on the left we have a beaker and this beaker has a total 10 milliliters of stuff, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six particles of stuff. So we'll say six moles of solute. Well, the concentration of this quote unquote solution then, uh, you know, even let's just make it even easier. Let's say that this is one liter, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna change my mind. We're just keeping it real simple. Six moles in one liter. This means that this particular hypothetical solution is going to have a six molar concentration. Well, if we add more water to the solution, we're not going to add or decrease the number of moles of stuff we have. Let's say we double the volume of water. We're doubling the volume of our solution to two liters, but we'd still have one, two, three, four, five, six moles of stuff present. It's just more spread out six moles of solute. Well, since by definition, concentration uh, slash molarity is just moles per liter, here we have six moles 
divided by two liters, which gives us a three molar solution. We doubled the volume and cut the concentration in half. And the reason why this relationship occurs is because, again, we did not change the amount of solute there is. So the more volume we add, proportionally, the less of a concentration we are going to have. So this is what fundamentally makes our equation M1V1 equals M2V2 true, where the subscripts of the ones pertain uh, to quote unquote before dilution. So the measurements here, the concentration and the volume, that capital M and the capital V are going to be measurements from before dilution. So in this case, we're going to take the six molar, which is going to be our M1 and one liter, which is going to be our initial volume. And the subscript of the two pertains to after dilution which after dilution, we said that our concentration was three molar and our total volume was two liters. Now we can see in the way that I've set up this equation here, there's no unknown variable. We're just filling in known information, but it's important to recognize kind of systematically, you know, uh, let's say qualitatively, how we set up this equation and what it's supposed to mean. On the left-hand side, six moles or six molar, six moles per liter, times one liter tells us that we have six moles of stuff. And on the right-hand side of the equation, three moles per liter times two liter also tells us that we have six moles. The left and the right-hand side of this equation are telling us the same thing, that we have six moles suspended in solution. So if, for instance, we run into a situation where, let's say we know information before the dilution, but we're trying to figure out a way to create let's say a three molar solution, we might ask, or ask ourselves, what volume do I have to dilute this equation to to get this particular concentration that I want? In that case, the volume afterwards is going to be a question mark. And now we suddenly have an equation that's useful for us that we can use to calculate. Well, if I need six moles on the other side, and I'm working with a three molar solution, as we saw from the setup of this, I'm going to need two liters to make this equation true. So in the previous example that we just worked through, the, no, or the variables were all known. We knew exactly what the concentrations were, what the volumes were, right? We were using that to explain the setup of the equation. We needed to make sure the numbers of moles are equal on both sides. Since we're not changing the amount of solute, we're only changing the amount of solvent. So we can ask ourselves, well, what other types of setups uh, are gonna be useful for using that equation, right? So aside from like, maybe a volume uh, needs to be found to figure out like, how do we dilute something? What if in a uh, different situation, we already knew what the diluted concentration was and we're trying to retrospectively figure out what the original, more concentrated concentration was? Well, that's exactly what this problem uh, it sets up. We have 10 milliliters of a sample of concentrated red dye 40, and we are told that it was diluted to 250 milliliters in order to find the more diluted concentration, which is 2.3 times 10 to the negative 2 molar. We are then asked, what is the molarity of the original sample? So this type of problem kind of outlines uh, let's say how the numbers can sometimes make the equation we're working with m1 v1 equals m2 v2 a little bit tricky but fundamentally this equation is going to be set up in the exact same way that we just saw when all of the variables were known there is something that was more concentrated and then it was diluted so as long as you are keeping track of what variables correspond to the concentrated, the before, as well as what variables correspond to the diluted after, it's going to be a pretty straightforward process to kind of parse out what variables are supposed to go where. So I would like you guys to use this equation and calculate what uh, was the concentration of the more concentrated sample before dilution occurred. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you were able to 
I don't know, plug and chug, <laughs> insert the variables where they need to go. Uh, and of course, there's going to be one variable that we must rearrange and solve for. So let's work through this problem and uh, kind of come to a solution together. We're gonna use M1V1 equals M2V2 to solve for an original concentration. We are told in this problem that the original volume of the concentrated dye was 10 milliliters. So this is going to be equal to our V1. The solution was then diluted to 250 milliliters. This is after dilution has occurred, which means that this must be V2. And the concentration of the more diluted solution was 2.3 times 10 to the negative two molar. This is going to be M2. All right, so if we just kind of follow along as we're reading in the paragraph, labeling the variables as we go, it becomes pretty straightforward as to what numbers are supposed to go where. So on the concentrated side of things, we do not know what our concentration is, right? That's the only thing that's not labeled here. And specifically, we're asked to find the molarity of the original. This is M1. V1 is going to be that 10.0 milliliters. And yes, we can use milliliters here. We don't necessarily have to convert to liters, and I will show you why in a second. The volume after dilution, we are told is 2.3 times 10 to the negative two molar. And the volume afterwards was 250.0 milliliters. And here we see why we don't necessarily need to convert liters uh, or milliliters into liters. Since we have milliliters on the left and milliliters on the right, as we rearrange and solve for M1, which we are going to do by dividing each side by 10.0 milliliters, we can see that the milliliters here are going to cancel out, as well as cancel on the left-hand side. This means that the only unit that remains is a capital M. So yes, molarity by definition is moles per liter. This doesn't necessarily mean that the volumes in our dilution equation also have to be in liters. These could be in milliliters so long as the volume units are consistent, AKA as long as they are equal with each other on the left and the right hand side, they will mathematically cancel out. This actually saves us a little bit of work since we don't have to convert milliliters to liters. If you did, that's totally fine. You should have come up with the same answer. I'm just saying in the future, you don't necessarily have to go through that process. All right, so we're gonna take 2.3 times 10 to the negative two, multiply it by 250 and divide it by 10. This gives us a value of 0.575 molar. So this is the concentration of the original solution. Um, and a good kind of like right mental critical thinking kind of double check is since this is the concentration of the left hand side, this is M1, which is supposed to be more concentrated. We just want to double check and make sure that this value is in fact greater than the diluted concentration. Well, since 0.575 is greater than 2.3 times 10 to the negative two, it looks like we're mathematically in the clear. You know, we didn't accidentally lose an exponent or drop a decimal point or something like that. All right, so this is then going to be the concentration of the more diluted solution, this 0.575 uh, molar. All right, so across these two examples on the previous slide here, where we laid out all of the known variables and kind of hypothetically substituted in a question mark for a final volume, um, or whether in this example, we had all of the diluted information and we were kind of in retrospect trying to find a piece of the concentrated information, we can use M1V1 equals M2V2 to find this. So long as we don't add or subtract any solute particles, this equation will work to tell us uh, what the relationship is of the concentration and volume before and after dilution occurs. All right, and that is 9.1 in the books. So here we have uh, discussed today all of our general properties, as well as introduced how we measure concentrations of these solutions using molarity. Uh, and again, we've kind of seen this in lab already, but it's nice to have kind of the, let's say formal definition now under our belts. All right, so when we come back for lecture uh, next and we're talking about nine or going through 9.2, we are going to start talking about chemical reactions that occur inside of aqueous solutions. So get ready for that. Uh, until then though, if you have homework, double check and do your homework. And until next time, class is dismissed.